Hi, we're now streaming live and um, we're still one minute to go until the show actually goes live. Um, anybody that joining us now, I'm thrilled that you're joining us. Hopefully you're watching us live on Facebook or on LinkedIn, thanks to the wonders of Restream. Um, or you might be watching us on YouTube on our playlist, the BIP Chat playlist. So welcome. And in a minute, we will be introducing you to the show. And fantastic to have you all here. Um, I'm going to try and flick around a little bit to um, to see if there's chats going on because LinkedIn does have the capacity to do the chats, um, um, which is a little bit scary, but I shall be doing that because there's two of us, Thomas and I hosting the show. Um, and um, I'm just looking here. So if I look like I'm looking weirdly into the camera, I'm actually looking on my screen here to see how this is all getting streamed. Um, and I think we are live now. Yep, I can see us on my profile, which is fantastic. Amazing, uh, isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? I can see you. It's very interesting, anybody watching this, how LinkedIn works when you do a LinkedIn Live. We've just started this. And if you go to my profile, instead of my cover photo, I end up seeing us all there moving about and um, saying hello and everything. So, and, and can all those guys see that on their profile when they go to your profile? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Amazing. It's amazing, isn't it? The wonders of technology. So here we are. It's now 1.30 and welcome to our show this week. So what's it all about? Well, BitChat this week, we've got three wonderful guests led by Dipti Tate, who's going to introduce uh, Elaine and James. But we're talking today about hacking your mind. What on earth is that? Um, Dipti, why don't you uh, why don't you tell us about uh, Elaine and James, and then Penny, you can ask Dipti about what on earth mind hacking is. I will, I will. And before we do that, I'm just going to introduce a little bit more about the show because some people won't have watched this before. So you may know Thomas and I. We've been married for 31 years. Um, we've been working together for 23 years. We still do actually quite like each other, which is very fortunate. Both have very different ways of communicating, probably, which is great. Um, we love it. And um, this well, is our, the right way in the show. Yeah, way. exactly. And this is our weekly chat show that goes out 1.30 uh, live onto Facebook and into uh, LinkedIn. And it's with it's called BIP because it stands for Business is Personal. And Business is Personal is really our philosophy in life. We give everyone permission to feel that business is personal, which is contra to those people that say and said to it's me. It's nothing personal. It's it's not it's not personal penny it's just business and then when someone said that to me i got pretty upset which is in the taken scene with liam neeson well i wasn't in that scene but also for those who are <laughs> yeah, that movie was actually enthusiasts. when he had somebody had a gun to liam neeson it was nothing yeah. personal it was just business yeah so um so in these weekly chat shows we talk to our bip 100 member and they bring in two guests to really create an arousal around a subject. And this week, as Thomas said, we've got Dipti Tate, which is extremely exciting. Um, and so Dipti, we know you as an amazing psychotherapist and hypnotherapist. I've worked with you myself on my sleep. Thomas has on some of his. I love what Dipti does. She resets and recharges yeah. me. And I just love the way she takes you down and zaps you, reboots you, and brings you back up. <laughs> I know. It's wonderful for me because she did that for Thomas every Friday evening, which meant I had a lovely weekend when he'd been zapped <laughs> and charged. Um, and Dipti um, is the author of Good Grief here which is a book that you can get but it also has a very exciting book coming out called planet grief yes and um so dipti tell us a little bit more about you and tell us about your book that's coming out and then please do introduce your wonderful guests Thank you, Thomas and Penny. That was a lovely introduction, as always. So yes, I have Planet Grief, which is my second book coming out in October. And I thought today what would be really, really brilliant is that I get two of my contributors to come along to share the sofa with me and talk about two very, I get, I guess, two very polarized versions of grief. So I have Elaine. Elaine and I met 
I think it was 2012, Elaine, was it 2012 or 2013? It was a, a while ago. And um, Elaine is my longest client. So she's been with me as a client for however many years that is, nine, something like that. And um, so Elaine has um, a lovely story um, in my book, which uh, we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, it was quite emotional, actually. And then I have James and his cat, <laughs> who's making an appearance. Oh, the cat. <laughs> uh, James is a brilliant contributor to Planet Grief because James is a cyber security enthusiast and expert. And now people might think, well, how is cyber security and grief related? That's the most fascinating part about what we're going to be talking about with James, because I wanted to explore the idea of how emotional hacking and emotional mind hacking is the same as a computer hack. So I wanted to find somebody who could explain this to me. And I asked him the question, is an, an, is an emotional hijack the same as a computer hack? And his answer was yes. And then we we dove or dived, whatever. Is it dive or doved? We dived and doved into that. And um, so I thought that would be really interesting to explore today. So we have Elaine with the very emotional, you know, aspects of grief, and we have James with the very intellectual aspects of grief and I think it wow. would be to, to merge these uh, together. Absolutely brilliant and I think what really is inspiring for me about you Dipti is um, you have really opened up my world around what grief is because yes. we tend to relate grief to the loss of someone which is the case with Elaine with, in my case, it was the loss of a business in Thomas's case and how you do that. Um, and you cover that grief really does cover a wide range of emotions. So anybody listening today, I think we all have emotions, thank goodness. We're not all robots yet. I don't know what century that's going to be. Maybe James would be able to predict something oh, like that's that. that's not far away. Oh, don't tell me that. Um, <laughs> In fact, my daughter, I have to say on that subject, Hannah once said to me, Mum, you know, I, I know you're not racist, but I hope you're not going to be racist when I have a robot in my house. And I said, what do you mean? She said, because my, my robot, you're not going to be used to that, are you? <laughs> so she's absolutely convinced that she's going to have a robot in her house that's going to be like a person, which is okay. quite interesting. So in a way, anyway, it's not racist, it's cyberist. It's cyberist or whatever that is. Cyberist. Quite a, um, wow, quite a new word. Anyway, so we all do have emotions and some of us are fearful of them. Some of us don't express it. It's absolutely wonderful that Elaine has very kindly to uh, have the courage here to, to, to lay bare what she's been through. But emotions will be very different to a lot of people. And I mean, I don't know whether you want to quickly go through, Dipti, some of what some of the different things that people can grieve. As you say, grief isn't necessarily related to death because Elaine, even though Elaine has experienced quite a lot of death in the last year and a half, she has also lost her business as well. She's a dance teacher. She will also talk to you about this. And so there's that same amount of grief that happens when we lose something we've either invested in. So that could be time, money, love. So anything that we lose that we've loved will we'll create a gap in our lives, will punch a hole in our hearts. And in that hole and in that gap, I believe sits grief. So it could be like you and Thomas, Penny and Thomas have lost, had lost the Academy. And, you know, we share about this story in the book as well. Um, so losing a business, you know, um, empty nest syndrome, you know, my kids are now leaving leaving to go to university and so um you know I've got that kind of oh who am I now if I'm not a mother you know well I'm obviously I'm still a mother but if I'm not a day-to-day -day mother there's this gap again so empty nest even in the good times I believe we can grieve and that's a new concept I don't think many people talk about this so even things like getting married 
you are walking down the aisle this way towards your partner, but you're walking away from some kind of um, independence or uh, agency. Uh, so you have to be able to acknowledge what you're leaving behind, even though you might be going towards something good. Does that make sense? It makes huge sense. And now I was thinking when you were talking there about people, uh, there must be through this pandemic, people really grieving their normal work life as well. Are you coming across that? Definitely, you know, all the time. Yeah, we're talking, about, you know, when the government were talking about um, the new normal, I was saying there is nothing normal about the new because new and normal can't be put in the same sentence. You know, that's a, an oxymoron. It's the new different. So anytime anything changes, anytime something is different, we've got to adapt. We've got to learn to work it out. It's new territory. You know, so that's why when we are, even though there might be good things about this, you know, working from home, uh, less travel time, you know, more time with the family and all of this, thing, all of this, you know, positive stuff. But it's still another thing that we've got to get used to, isn't it? Yeah. So, Dipsy, when you I remember when I left school, I missed that school. When I left college, I missed that college. When I left a company, I missed that company. Are all those missing events, are they a form of grief? Yeah, so it's a way of life that you've gotten used to. So um, again, in the book, I explore this with Sharon Davis, um, the Olympic swimmer. She talks about when she uh, stopped competing as a, a professional swimmer, how she obviously had a regimented life when she was in competition world. And then when she stopped competing, it was almost like she was just left to her own devices. And she yeah. really struggled with that because of her different, there was no routine. No one was watching what she ate. No one was telling her where to be at a certain time. Um, and that caused a she lot. She have lost her identity as well. She lost her identity. She lost her purpose. She lost her mission. And then she had to try and figure out who she was now. This is a new version of herself. So in the same way, Thomas, when you you lose, you, you leave the school, that's been your routine. You leave a company. You've kind of been with the same people. You're, st you're sort of walking into new territory and that's, there is an element of leaving something behind which obviously grief is a spectrum you know there's bit there'll be bits of grief that you'll feel sometimes you won't even notice it and other times it will just come at you and you'll think well why am I feeling like this at least if you can attribute it to grief and label it it feels better I think yeah I agree with you because I often said mm. you know I wish we'd had a wake for our business mm. and I think you're right it's it's where we almost need to create the full stop and then move on or something isn't it that acknowledgement that knowledge point and that thing about identity I know that Thomas and I went through that because we were identified for 14 years as the people who founded the first social network in the world we were quite globally recognized and I remember one day being asked to do a talk in Farnham where I live and I used to be on a sort of a world stage and I was introduced rather than being introduced as the most connected person alongside Thomas in the world I was introduced as the most connected person in Farnham and, <laughs> <laughs> and it was sort of wow this is quite a change and it's sort of coming to do to terms with changing your life and finding that new different that you can love I suppose isn't it <laughs> yes <laughs> I, I know how expressive my face is, so I think before I got up onto that little platform to do my talk, my face probably said it all when they introduced me like that. Anyway. So let's get into the hacking, yeah. the hacking part, the, 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 the computer hacking, the mind hacking. Dipsy, where, where, where does James and Elaine come in here? How, how, how does it work in your, in your hacking example, in your hacking theory? <laughs> Okay, so my theory was that our emotions can get the better of us, you know, if we're not careful. Um, so if you think about the brain and how it works, there's the intellectual mind that's kind of got control, that feels like it can plan, it can process properly, it's got a system. Then there's the emotional mind, which is a little bit like slippery snakes, you know, and you kind of 
they just, they just can go anywhere and you, you kind of don't really know how to contain them. So if we can't contain our emotional mind with our intellectual mind, in my opinion, I feel like then that has, we have had a hack happen to us and our brain. So we've been hacked and hijacked by our own emotional mind. And then this causes a disturbance in our balance. So like a virus, and that's where James and I had a conversation and I was like, this is just so brilliant, <laughs> you know, because I was thinking this is a tenuous link. And, and James said, no, it isn't. It's, it's a really good link. So I'm going to, I think it'd be good for me to ask James to remind me what he told me <laughs> in that brilliant interview. I think there were various bits to it. I mean, the first one was looking at um, phishing attacks where people are trying to defraud people and it is actively trying to use that emotional hijack, use that emotional impact on people. How deliberate, how carefully constructed that is, is debatable, but that's what it's doing uh, ultimately. And so I one see. of the things that I teach people is if you're getting an emotional punch from an email or a text message or something, even if it's just a bit of frustration from Royal Mail telling you you've got to pay one ninety nine to get your package. If there's some sort of emotional punch, you really need to take that step back, because at that point you aren't thinking straight. You aren't critically evaluating everything you're doing and you are vulnerable. So well, these hackers, James, who try and fish, pH fish. They are sophisticated psychologists as well, then? No. No, they just know which tactics work. There's, there's not careful crafting and psychological theory behind it. It's just they have found that these things work, and they do. So is there something, because when I was thinking of you there, you, I was thinking, you know, I put loads of protection into my computer, to try and stop myself from having these issues. I try, well, Thomas is very good at this. He's constantly nagging me about if I got my virus updated. And then also I create knowledge inside myself to know when the triggers might be, I might be triggered by something emotionally. So is there, is there a connection there with all of this in terms of, of understanding your world compared to the emotional world? Definitely. And there's we we call it instant response, which, again, has a lot of similarities. You spot the signs of an instant and then you go to a manual, a plan that you've written out on how to deal with it step by step. So you're not having in that moment to think through the emotions, think through everything else. You're just able to follow the plan. And then afterwards, you take the time to reevaluate everything, look at it, see what worked, see what didn't, see if you could have improved the way that you reacted. But you're not saying something's gone wrong. Let's deal with it right now, off the cuff, try and work out what we're doing as we fly through it. Oh, wow. Interesting, James. Does that mean, is that, I've got to get the question right here, is that, why the media and the social media are trying to create shock messaging to try and garner an instant response because you're you're rewarded with the tokens of likes and shares so you're you're motivated to be instantly response cross and angry yep uh, anger drives engagement on social media you are more likely to post on something because you disagree with it, you don't like it, you want to argue about it. There's, it's, it's a huge problem, and we've seen some of the problems it leads to over the last few years. There's genuinely major issues there. I don't have the fix for them, uh, but there is work being done to try and find out what should be done. There was a few years ago a case where Facebook were told by some of their staff the algorithm we're using is driving societal polarization and division because it's relying so much on these emotions and no one's able to communicate properly when they're feeling that way. Um, and they decided that actually the profits were worth it. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's very sad, oh, human, human nature, isn't it? It's very sad. Where... So it's manipulation for the sake of shareholder mm -hmm. benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting, isn't it? Because I just had a tweet. I did a tweet. Well, I shared a tweet about Afghanistan and I happened to use the words, you know, I hope 
that um, people in the Western world, real, like women in the Western world, like, realise how lucky they are to be educated. And I immediately got this reaction from someone saying, it's not luck, we're entitled to education. And, and I thought, oh gosh, and it was an also immediate telling off. And it's interesting how people jump to that. They look for how to outsmart you or something often on social media. So Dipti, when you, when you look at this, because I know, I know through the, the therapy I've been through, I've learned techniques and, to, and a lot around self-awareness and a lot that I to protect myself. Is this, is this why you're interested in this? Because you're looking at what, what's your interest here and where are the parallels with how you help your clients? So when James said anger, for example, drives action um, and it will cause a reaction on social media, if you imagine that that's actually happening in the brain as well. So when we get stimulated by our own emotional mind, so we feel angry, we feel um, anxious or we feel scared, so fear, that will also cut out any intellect, you know, because that will take precedence in the brain. And then therefore we will be acting angry, we'll be acting anxious, we'll be acting scared. And when we behave angry, scared, anxious, we are either going to be um, attack mode or defense mode. And you're not in a calm state of mind at all. You're actually acting out stress. So the opposite of stress is relaxation. So when we know we've got, like James talked about, having the procedures or protocols or um, action steps in place and you've thought about it beforehand, if something does come and get you out of nowhere, and this is kind of what we do with Elaine when we do our therapy sessions. It's it's not about preventing things from happening because we we can't, you know, we don't know what's going to happen on the outside. But it's definitely helping you resource things from the inside, like your antivirus software. It's creating an alert to say, oh, something's come in. Do something about it now, you know, and it, it's putting those yeah. systems in place. And you can program that into people, can you, Dipton? It's more about educating people. So I'm not sitting there like a, a programmer programming someone's brain because <laughs> that does sound a bit strange. I don't think Elaine would like that, would it? <laughs> would you, Elaine? <laughs> if I sat there and recoded your brain for you. But essentially, if we're going to talk about it in those terms, that's basically what we are doing, isn't it, Elaine? Because it's it's, it's giving you education where you think about things differently and then you behave differently. So in a way, you are recoding your behaviour. Would you say that was fair? Yeah, I, I, I think personally, it's giving people the tools um, to be able to deal with situations and look at it from a strategic point of view, how they can actually cope with certain situations in a positive way, as opposed to it's always going to be a negative way because you're dealing with negative situations. So Elaine, it's, um, it's beautiful to have you here. And, and I honestly want to honour your courage here because puts a lump in my throat when I think what you've been through. Um, Elaine, would you like, would you like, or would you be willing, I should say, maybe not like, but to share your story with us? Yeah, certainly. Um, and it's a pleasure to be able to share this story in some ways. Uh, it's not something that I would, looking back, uh, we coped with it, uh, and as a lot of people do in these situations. But I also think life throws uh, things at people and, You've got two sort of avenues that you can explore. The one avenue is to try and deal with it and help yourself through help through Dipti or other channels, or you go through the depression route, um, perhaps medication and things like that. So I, you know, and one doesn't fit all. Um, I think the biggest thing is people don't talk about it. The biggest thing for me is I can't believe I'm talking about it. Um, and that really is a big plus because I do think a lot of people think not just about my own story, but I think about grief in general, whether it be grief from losing people, people dying that's close to you or any type of grief. They think it's almost a slant on their personality or that they can't cope uh, and they don't want to share it because they think people will be, you know, will judge them. 
And I think that that is very sad because then people can't get the help that they deserve. Oh, these are incredibly wise words, Elaine, beautifully put as well. So, so not you rehearsed went either. Very, <laughs> no, not rehearsed at all. You went through a very challenging year last year. Do you want to take us through those four people that you lost? Yeah, so um, incredibly lucky to have had both my parents living till 95, 96. Uh, my dad's health was starting to suffer. Um, he was in and out of hospital. It was a challenging few years because they don't live close. So it was always a call. Do I go down and visit? Do I have to go into the hospital with him? So we went through that for quite a long time. Uh, previous to that, my mum was diagnosed with Alzheimer's um, and she remained at home where dad would not let her go anywhere until it came to the point we had to do something about it because she was unsafe. It was unsafe for her to be at home, even with all the support that we could do and with outside support. Uh, she would just walk out the door or we had to lock her in when we were all inside the house. It, it was just not acceptable anymore for her safety and for my dad's. So that was challenging. Um, in amongst dealing with all that on a day to day basis uh, and running my own dancing business because I do Strictly stuff which is all just kicking off again um, and trying to put a brave, not a brave face, but a happy face, because when people are coming to you for a service, they always ask how you are. But, you know, they don't want an hour of me sort of giving all my bad negatives. They want some good experiences as well that they're paying for that service. So that was the other slant. And I think probably the other um, big thing we had to deal with, my husband got diagnosed with uh, bowel cancer. So we were dealing with all these different balls that we were juggling to try and just keep life ticking over. And looking back, the emotional blackmail at the time, um, you just deal with. It, the emotional grief is only now happening. Um, right. I think because you're in that time, you're in that moment, so you deal with what you have to do. And I'm very good at doing that. And I think a lot of people are um, because you just carry on. So my dad died on the 29th of February 2020, which strangely enough was leap day. So that was a little bit, you know, odd. Um, he died at home where he wanted to be. And I was there at the time. Um, I think one of the hardest things that, um, and throughout all this time, I've sort of known Dipti before all these tragic circumstances, because I've wanted to get my own sort of mental health in order, um, take charge of it a little bit. And I'm not averse to saying, yeah, let's try some hypnotherapy or, um, you know, let's try some self-help sort of medication books and things like that. And I think that that is really good. You can only do that when you want to do it yourself. Um, because it's no good me, I can pay Dipsy any amount of money, but if I'm not willing or anybody's not willing to accept that, then it's not going to be any good. And no. I really don't know why um, all that time ago it was that time that I wanted to do something about my own health, um, but I was willing to, to give that, that challenge. So after dad died, one of the hardest things was not being able to tell my mum. So they'd been married 72 years. She was in a care home. Wow. And you can't tell her. We took the decision. She didn't even know us. She didn't, you know, and what do you say? You go and tell her something that she wouldn't understand. She has pictures in her room, or she did, of my dad when we went to the cenotaph and he had his medals on and all of those lovely things, but she wouldn't even know her husband had died. So yeah. that was probably quite unique in some ways. Yeah, very unique because you're almost carrying her pain as well, aren't you? Because you can't release yeah. it after her. You can't, it's your, it becomes your pain for her in a way, I imagine. Um, um, and I mean, she died not ever knowing her husband had already died before her. Yeah. Well, um, let's hope she did meet again. Yeah, I and I'm sure, I'm sure they are. I've had many words when I've been sat in my summer house with them. Um, but we took that decision because it, 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 not just for her, but for us and my sister and the family, because there's quite a lot to consider there, how upsetting it is, uh, even not not sort of telling her about the funeral or anything like that. 
um, because at that time, you know, she didn't really know who she was. Yeah. Now and again, she would have a glimmer of hope that she might know you. And then other times there was nothing. So you have to take um, a little bit of an interest and think, okay, you know, is this going to do her any good? Is it going to do us any good? And it, it wasn't. And we knew that she wouldn't last. And all through this time, through dad, I was um, in contact with Dipti because I needed support, not just from the family, um, but I think it's important at certain times to have an outside support that you can say certain things to without thinking, oh, I better not say that's it's going to upset somebody or it's too personal, too close. Um, so I did have the support and I had the hypnotherapy and not all the time. Um, I dipped in and out of it as I thought I needed it, but I needed to be able to process what was going on and how I was dealing with it at the time. Um, so mum subsequently went into decline and I had one of those horrible calls over a weekend like you do. She's on end of life care. Um, it, we were already in lockdown and it's can you go and see her? And the care home didn't say no, but if I had have gone, I'd have had to have then been in isolation for 14 days, completely on my own. Couldn't have done that here because of husband's job and everything else. Um, and also because of the risk there was COVID in the home. It was never said that she definitely had COVID at the time, uh, although it was on her death certificate. So it's, yeah, that was pretty, pretty but tragic. Really, um, what you're sharing here is, I mean, a lot of people will be listening and be able to re relate in some way to it, but it's extraordinary. We've, we've had some quite serious losses in our family life um, and it is very, very serious but to not be able to grieve and manage it in the normal way um, really is an extra punch in the stomach and um, what's coming through to me listening to you Elaine and then listening to James and Dipti is there's a subject here that we haven't covered yet which I think is is about resilience um, you can almost apply that to what James has talked about, which is the resilience that we need to create in our life around all these horrible people that are trying to hack us. Um, and computers. It, yeah. They've referred to computer resilience. Compu and yeah. And then Elaine, it's so inspiring that you realised in advance that your mental health was something you needed to consider. Uh, I tend to use the word mental fitness because I think many of us... Um, We'll say we haven't got a mental health problem because we attach mental health to bipolar or serious depression or whatever. And I hit a point where I realized that I did have a mental health problem and I went to a psychologist. But since then, I have realized that to remain resilient, I have to constantly work on my mental fitness in the same way that I have to work on my physical fitness. Um, I can't take for granted unless I eat well and I exercise, I'm not always going to be physically healthy. And I see the same parallel. So there's to me something here is I always want to build resilience into myself because we things come at us really unexpectedly. And what it sounds like to me, Elaine, is that you had managed to build up some positive resilience in you for this period. Do you feel that you did have that? Um, yes, in, in some ways, um, I think... By the time then my father-in-law died in December last year um, and closely followed by my mother-in-law who committed suicide. I think each time you go through all of this and then we were in lockdown. So obviously I didn't have my dancing business. We were closed. We can't, couldn't dance. It just wasn't allowed. So there's so much going on. Um, there comes a point that you've got to actually take charge of, of your own self because you say, you know, I can't be feeling like this anymore. And also, I think you, you get to a point where you get over one hurdle and, you know, it's, it's like trying to jump the, the Grand National and you suddenly come to Breaches Brook and you think, do you know what? I just can't do this anymore. So I yeah. think people um, in general do need to take sort of charge of that in whichever shape, form they find helps for them. Hypnotherapy helped for me um, because I found it was something that, I could use, I could help with. And since then, the uh, one other sort of slightly interesting thing maybe, although that my business completely went and income and everything else, 
I have used that time to get up early in the morning, do my exercise, do some meditation, um, do all the good things that you know you should be doing, but in normal life, uh, it gets to probably mid afternoon and you haven't completed those tasks. So I have been getting a better routine. I've completely stopped drinking alcohol. I've upped my exercise. All the good things that you know you should be doing through all these times, but you don't always do it. Yeah. So interestingly, you you took personal responsibility, and all the all the power is in the pain, as is often said. And if I can link that personal responsibility back to you, James, because personal responsibility on on computers, not just antivirus updates, but dealing with these phishing attacks coming in, as you say. Uh, these hackers target your emotions with uh, special offers and invoices to complete and SMS. To lottery answer. wins. I got very excited. Lottery thinking wins. Won a lottery once. Um, but but what what intrigues me, James, in terms of in terms of hacking, is that despite all of this technology that we have from Microsoft and Google and these various organisations, the the hackers can still get through. So h- how do we take more personal responsibility? to stay on top of these machines that now, um, dare I say, rule our lives. Uh, if you can answer that one, then I, I know people who'd pay you a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's one of the biggest problems we've got. People need to use these systems. We need to use them a lot. Our societies depend on them. The fact that people can use them means these systems can be abused. There are ways you can limit that. There are protections you can put in place. But you eventually get to a point where you're putting so much control and rigidity into a system that you can't use it anymore. So there's a balance with that. Getting people to take more responsibility is fine, but you can't take responsibility if you don't understand why you need to and what you need to take responsibility for. So there's a huge education piece there. But really, the answer is no one knows the answer to that yet. We're still working on it. We've been working on it since the start of cybersecurity about 10 years ago and before that with security in general. And so yeah, James, if you that can answer you that. A, are you a security guard or are you a teacher? Um, I, I do security. Most of that is about explaining what it means to people. Uh, being there to translate and educate people more than anything else. I'm not going to stand there and delete the virus before you open it because that's pointless. I can't be everywhere. There's a massive shortage of security people. Even if we wanted to, we couldn't issue everyone with their own personal security guard. So it has to be about that education piece. That's, that is absolutely that's brilliant. very good, isn't it? So and, effectively, and, he's teaching security. Well, yeah, but- yeah, get to, to get people to take their personal responsibility for oh, it. Yeah. So, Dipti, my goodness, it's we've only got about five minutes left, which is incredible. When you um, this personal responsibility piece here, this must be something that you're really aware of when people come to you and they've got their pains, they've got their issues. Um, sometimes I know that it's not doesn't come from that point. Sometimes it's people saying, "Can you help me to be?" be the more powerful me, isn't it? They're, they're wanting to level up or whatever the expression is, aren't they? How, how, what do you notice about people taking personal responsibility? Is that something a lot of people find hard? Well, again, like James just said, either people get in touch with him because they've got hacked, you know, or they want to prevent being hacked. Yeah. Same thing with, uh, with therapy. So I will have about the same amount of people who say, you know, that they have tried to commit suicide and they have now, obviously they failed because they were sitting with me. So they say, I don't, I don't know where else to go. So there's that type of, you know, extreme situation to, oh, I just like to um, get on board with something or I just need a little bit of motivation to help me complete a task or run a marathon or whatever it is. So you've got the same spectrum similar there where people are trying to um support themselves before something major happens like elaine started with me because of that the same situation because elaine and i have been working with each other since 2013 and now we're at 2021 but elaine didn't come at 2020 saying this has happened you know so she's actually done it 
on both ends. That's brilliant. You know, if everyone could do that, and that's, I suppose, what James would probably say, if everyone had that same amount of wherewithal, I guess, with uh, recognizing that any system can be infiltrated. So it's always worth protecting the system originally and then keeping the system safe as you keep going. Our brain's exactly the same thing. You know, it needs it needs protection and it needs support. So does that mean to, to pick up on antivirus and, and firewalls in the security business that we have to build some kind of firewall inside around our minds to protect it from these these shock attacks or these shock uh, hacks yes i call it emotional immunity emotional immunity oh, i like that you're good at coming up with new words phrases, you are. they are fantastic it's in my book <laughs> when, I was, um, when i was listening to you about that uh, dipti i was thinking that it actually in all cases whether it's with James or with, um, uh, you know, on computers or with whether it's around our, um, our minds and our emotions, we have to realise that we're all vulnerable and be aware of that vulnerability. And I suppose that's something a lot of us run away from. We, we don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to admit to being vulnerable. Um, but we are all vulnerable, aren't we? We're all lovely, cosy, coochie, adorable human beings. And oh like our immune, <laughs> yeah. like, like, our, like our physical immune system, it can get infiltrated, right? So can yeah. our, our our emotional and our mental immune system. So hypnotherapy, I believe, is enhancing the mental and emotional immune system, while other things enhance the physical immune system. Yeah, I love that. That is very good. Um, James, I'm thinking about another question because you've intrigued me about what you said earlier about uh, anger creates engagement, particularly on social media. Um, does, does, does this mean all the, all the social networks, the social media that create all these, this noise, are they themselves the hackers of our minds? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that is essentially what they're doing with usually with the help of advertisers and others. But if you look at some of the conspiracy theories out there, some of the disinformation and misinformation out there, yeah, absolutely. They're providing a platform for people to attack the way that we think and the things that we believe, and they are helping with those attacks. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Well, it's been a fascinating show, everybody. I, it's absolutely wonderful. I'm going to enjoy sharing this more into social media. I think it makes me think about um, our own vulnerability to being influenced. And I suppose when we're talking about social media, you know, we, we're either open to that attack or we're not. And we have to realise that I remember the story that, you know, Kellogg's invented the the belief system in us all that breakfast is the most important meal of the day yes and we all believed it and now we're all being told that intermittent fasting is actually critical for um, regeneration of our cells and longe longevity of life and, and avoid breakfast completely and, yeah and so it makes you realize what are we absorbing that we are believing and being influenced by and i suppose that's both you know through the social media and th through anything that can hack our minds dipti so I think this is absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Elaine, so much for sitting here and sharing and also really inspiring us all to realize how important it is to build up that resilience and keep that positive mind. I wish you great success with your dance classes as you open up a hope again, because yeah. I think dancing and music must be one of the most therapeutic things you can do for people. And I imagine people absolutely love your courses. And um, so I really hope that they come back soon. Have you got a plan to bring them back? Oh, yes. I've been pretty busy with a new website. So I've got new wedding uh, packages all uh, being put out there as well. So, yeah, okay. September, where we're all kicking back off again. So, uh, yeah. Brilliant. And that's music to my heart. And I'll be watching Strictly as well. And I'll be imagining you helping people feel that, uh, feel that experience. James, thank you so much. I'm very, very intrigued. I can tell Thomas is by 
by um, what your where the way your mind works. And I hope if anybody's watching this and they're interested in learning more about security, they get in touch with you through through LinkedIn. Dipti, as always, it's just so inspiring to be with you. Thank you hugely for what you've shared. I would like to um, mention that Dipti's website is diptitate.com. Am I right? Is it a .com? Diptate.com. Yeah. If you go on to that, she's got an emotional well-being a little questionnaire that you can take. I really recommend you do it. I've done it. It will give you a report. Um, it will tell you out of 100 the areas of your own emotional well-being you might want to think about. Uh, really exciting to take. Pass that on to other people that you know. It's a fantastic uh, little test there with massive amount of knowledge and some links in there that are really powerful. Now, next week, on our bit chat, we have Ricardo Milano, who is an amazing guy. He's coming to us from Colombia. He lived in the UK for a while. He went back to Colombia, I think about two years ago with his family. Um, he's a supplier to us and a client, actually. He's a BIP100 member, a phenomenal guy. He is very interested in the subject of community. So we're gonna be um, talking to him about that and also how he helps people to um, use, uh, basically use systems to join up all their clients and their CRM systems. It's going to be a really interesting chat to help anybody in business um, really improve their business. So um, there you go. We're at the top of the hour now. Quarter, well, not quite, quarter of the hour. Thank you so much, the three of you, for a really enjoyable conversation. I hope we can all stay in touch. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks, James. And thanks, Dipti. Bye. Bye-bye.